administration and the ruling People Power Party on Wednesday agreed to provide some 3.7 million small business owners with at least 6 million won each in pandemic-related assistance. The U.S. State Department says denuclearization on the Korean Peninsula is a shared goal between Seoul and Washington. The remarks come ahead of President Joe Biden's visit to South Korea late next week. Welcome to yet another edition of the Daily Report. It's Wednesday afternoon, May 11th here in South Korea. I'm Min San Hee. We start at the presidential office in Yongsan, where President Yoon Suk-yeol presided over his first meeting with senior secretaries, earlier on this Wednesday morning, that is, during which he touched upon a host of domestic issues. Our Yoon Jung-min has the story. On his second day in office on Wednesday, President Yoon suk yeol held his first meeting with his senior secretaries. He first mentioned economic difficulties with soaring costs due to the war in Ukraine and other global factors affecting people's livelihoods. On the issue of compensating small business owners hit by the COVID-19 pandemic, President Yoon urged the need to help them financially as soon as possible. He stressed the need for close work and cooperation among his senior secretaries without boundaries, adding it's the reason why he relocated and rearranged the presidential office. On security, the president urged for close monitoring of North Korea's nuclear situation. Yoon also highlighted the importance of unity, adding he saw news stories which pointed out that his inaugural speech on Tuesday lacked any mention of national unity and integration. He said the process of national unity is part of the process of the everyday politics, dismissing divisions between conservatives and liberals. President Yoon also emphasized social welfare and care for marginalized people, adding freedom goes together with social welfare. He commuted to work from his private home in Seocheogu district to Yongsan on Wednesday. Yoon Jung-min, Arirang News. Also on this Wednesday, the new government and the ruling People Power Party sat down to discuss an additional budget that will provide at least 6 million won each to some 3.7 million people who are self-employed or run small businesses that have borne the brunt of pandemic restrictions. Our Lee kyung reports. The Yoon suk yeol administration is pushing for the second extra budget of the year, worth at least 33 trillion Korean won or roughly 26 billion U.S. dollars. The government and the ruling People Power Party met on Wednesday, just a day after Yoon took office. Among other things, they agreed to provide some 3.7 million small businesses with virus prevention assistance worth at least 6 million Korean won each. That's roughly 4,700 U.S. dollars. During his campaign, President Yoon promised 6 million won worth of assistance, which together with the first round will amount to a total of 10 million won for each small business. Separate from the assistance, the budget would ensure businesses with 100 compensation for their losses resulted from COVID-19 restrictions instead of the current 90 percent. The minimum they can get has also doubled to roughly $800. The new scheme would also cover previously excluded sectors such as tourism, arts and exhibitions, and the airline industry. The budget will also be used to cushion the impact of soaring consumer prices. Up to 1 million won in emergency relief funds will be provided to some 2.3 million households with a minimum of four family members who are considered to be in the low income bracket. As for how to pay for the extra budget, Finance Minister Chu Gyeong-ho has ruled out issuing additional national bonds. We adjusted spending expenditures and used all available resources, such as the surpluses in the budget and at the central bank. 
Chu, whose role doubles as Deputy Prime Minister, was at the meeting virtually serving as Acting Prime Minister, as PM nominee Han dok su has yet to be approved by lawmakers. The specific details about budget plan will be announced on Thursday at a cabinet meeting. The finalized bill is expected to be submitted to the National Assembly the following day. Next Monday, lawmakers are set to convene a plenary session to go over the budget. For a swift passage, the government requires bipartisan cooperation from the now main opposition Democratic Party, which continues to hold a majority in the National Assembly. Young Eun, Arirang News. In related news, President Yoon suk yeol will preside over a cabinet meeting on Thursday at the top office in Yongsan to finalize the extra budget proposal. The top office is calling the upcoming meeting a provisional one as many ministerial positions remain vacant, including that of Prime Minister, as nominee Han dok su awaits parliamentary approval. Under law, for a president to call up the cabinet, 15 minister-level officials have to be present. Accordingly, some ministers from the former administration will make up the numbers. The top office this also says that as promised, once the cabinet is complete, President Yoon will host his first official cabinet meeting in Sejong, South Korea's administrative capital. And South Korea's new defense minister held his first meeting with top military commanders and called for, quote, an immediate and stern response to any direct provocation from North Korea. During the virtual meeting on this Wednesday, Lee jong sop claimed the situation on the peninsula is very grave amid threats from North Korea, including rampant missile tests as well as possible nuclear tests. He urged for a strong defense posture on land, at sea and in the air. His remarks come amid widespread speculation that North Korea could conduct a nuclear test as early as this month. Washington, meanwhile, has extended its vote of support to the new administration's calls for denuclearization on the Korean peninsula. The remarks come ahead of U.S. President Joe Biden's visit to South Korea late next week. Our Kim hyo reports. Washington has once again reaffirmed that completely denuclearizing the Korean Peninsula is a common goal of South Korea and the U.S. State Department Press Secretary Ned Price speaking at a press briefing Tuesday said the two allies will continue to coordinate closely on ways to achieve their common objective. The remarks were made when he was asked about South Korean President Yoon sang yeols inauguration speech, where Yoon said that his government will help revive Pyongyang's economy if the regime gives up its nuclear ambitions. Price further explained that the U.S. looks forward to continuing discussions when President Biden visits Seoul next week for a summit with Yoon. This comes as the U.S. says the North is expected to continue advancing its nuclear and missile capabilities this year with the aim of increasing its leverage in any potential talks with Washington. In a global threat assessment report submitted to the U.S. Senate Armed Services Committee before a budget hearing, Director of National Intelligence Averill Haynes explained that the regime continues to produce fissile materials, including plutonium and uranium programs for nuclear weapons. Against his backdrop, the U.S. has made a request to the U.N. Security Council to convene an emergency meeting to address North Korea's latest missile launches. According to multiple news outlets, including AFP, the UNSC is set to hold an open meeting later Wednesday to discuss North Korean issues. Kim Hyo-san, Arirang News. The U.S. is hosting the second global COVID-19 summit this week. In a readout on Tuesday, the White House said it is co-hosting the virtual event with Belize, Germany, Indonesia and Senegal on May 12th. The summit is widely seen as the U.S. seeking to reinforce its leadership against the influence of China and Russia. Meanwhile, South Korea's participation in this upcoming summit will likely be President Yoon suk yeols first global diplomatic debut. Now, Yoon has been highlighting the need for South Korea to expand its presence within the international arena while stressing the importance of the Seoul-Washington alliance. Direct communication between Presidents Yoon and Biden is unlikely at this particular gathering, but a Yoon-Biden summit is scheduled for next weekend. Meanwhile, on the local pandemic front, the daily tally continues to hover on the 40,000 level and the new government plans to monitor the situation before announcing the start of a new phase. Our Kim ji explains. South Korea reported 43,925 daily new coronavirus cases on Wednesday, the second straight day is stayed above the 40,000 level. 
Korea Disease Control and Prevention Agency said there were 383 critically ill patients, down 15 from a day earlier. 29 COVID-related deaths were recorded, marking a 0.13 percent fatality rate. South Korea's daily new infections have been on the downward trend since mid-March after a peak of over 620,000. So the new Yoon so government is trying to push forward toward a return to pre-pandemic normalcy. South Korea eased the country's outdoor mask mandate last Monday and downgraded the virus to a class 2 infection from class 1 on March 25th. The Ministry of Health and Welfare said Wednesday it will discuss next week whether it will proceed with the government's plans to officially declare the number of coronavirus cases as having plateaued or is in steady decline on May 23rd, indicating COVID-19 has become endemic in the country. One of the conditions is recording fewer than 100,000 daily infections, which would allow the medical system to readily provide treatment for confirmed patients. During the next 100 days, the ministry will unveil plans to carry out some of the coronavirus response measures released by the President Yoon's transition committee last month to prepare for a post-pandemic regime. This includes revamping coronavirus response measures based on scientific evidence, establishing sustainable infectious disease response measures, the protection of vulnerable groups of people in the low-income bracket, and the procurement of safe vaccines and coronavirus treatments. Kim ji Arirang News. And in other news, prospects within the local labor market are looking bright, with the country posting its greatest monthly growth in more than 20 years in April. Our Ichi Yoon has more. Things might be looking up on the employment front in South Korea. Some 865,000 people found jobs in April, the largest on-air increase for the month since the year 2000. Thanks to robust exports and more industries shifting to non-contact business operations, the number of employed people rose in April while the jobless rate dropped. The jobless rate fell one percentage point on year, the lowest for the month of April since 1999. And by age, those 60 and older found the most new jobs, adding over 400,000 positions on year. However, experts are cautious about predicting more positive figures going forward. Whether this trend will continue next month, we'll have to wait and see. We have to take into account the lingering uncertainties in the global economy, the war between Russia and Ukraine, as well as the decision in May to do away with social distancing in Korea. Watchers say it's a mixed bag for the domestic economy for the time being. Although it seems to be on a recovery track, it still faces soaring energy prices and global uncertainties. Lee ji Arirang News. Time now for a quick check on the local weather forecast. I have Che Jian standing by. Jian, welcome. Hi, Sunny. We had some slight rain, but things are clearing up. Now the sun is breaking through the clouds. It's still partly cloudy in many regions. And it's been raining on and off on Jeju, 5 to 10 millimeters, and slight drizzle on the south coast. Thankfully, fine dust is not bothering us today, but always factor in wide gaps in readings, which is a current trend for inland regions. It was chilly in the morning with early summer like heat in the afternoon and then things are much cooler again in the evening. So I hope you grab your jacket for later today. As a warm and moist wind is blowing into the country, high temperatures in southern areas will spike to 27 degrees, while that is much higher than the average. On the contrary, east coast regions will stay relatively cooler. That's the weather forecast for today. I'm Che Jian and back to you, Sunny. Right, and that ends part one of the Daily Report. We'll be back with part two, during which we'll discuss the pandemic and more. What matters?
Welcome back. You're with me for part two of the Daily Report and we start now with Viewpoint. The new administration has pledged to take a science-based approach to the pandemic and for more on these efforts and the current situation, I have Professor David Kwok from Sun Chenang University. Professor Kwok, it's been a while. Welcome back. Good afternoon, Sunny. I also have Dr. Kim Sing Tech from Institute Pasteur Korea. Dr. Kim, it's good to have you here again. Good afternoon. Now, Professor Kwok, before we touch upon Korea's COVID-19 situation, perhaps we could start with a few words about the unexplained pediatric uh, hepatitis cases that have been de detected across the world, including here in South Korea. One case was reported last week. Let's start with that. Right. So I don't want to scare uh, too many people by overly exaggerating what's happening. Uh, currently, they have found to be about 800 cases or so of uh, young children who are having rather severe cases of hepatitis of unknown ideology. They call it because some of them were found to contain, let's say, adenovirus, or some of, had, uh, some of them actually had some other infectious sources along with their symptoms. But the causal relationship from their infected sources to their symptoms were not found yet. And uh, sadly, eight people have died so far. And as you've mentioned, uh, Korea has found one uh, case of um, severe hepatitis with unknown ideology. Uh, they're currently researching why this is happening, but some speculations have been made, such as to the adenovirus that can cause hepatitis, that can also cause uh, a lot of the symptoms that all these children had. But other people are also saying it could have also happened due to lack of exposure to uh, viral sources going through the two years of pandemic for these young children. Uh, in normal cases, in re uh, regular cases, they would have been exposed to many different uh, infected sources and sort of build immune uh, immunity against them. But for the past two years or so, these young children were not able to do so. So many currently, many different factors and many speculations are being made. And uh, I guess I should be a little more glad that there have been very limited uh, numbers of cases found so far. But that's currently what's happening with the, the severe cases of hepatitis among children. I see. And meanwhile, on the local pandemic, front. Professor Kwok, what are your thoughts? Well, I'm quite thankfully saying uh, that it, it is being stabilized in this status of mitigation. Uh, so far, we have we are currently seeing about 40,000 or so cases daily happening, uh, but we, uh, we're quite differing from what we used to have before in the fact that a lot of these people being tested for COVID-19 are now coming into hospital and being checked for their symptoms, as opposed to a long time before. Everybody was coming through um, uh, being uh, for tests for COVID-19 because of tracings and because of close proximity to prior infected people and whatnot. So that's what we're currently seeing. But there are also speculations currently being made by KDCA itself that there's a possibility that we might see a slight resurgence happening towards the end of the May or possibly early June uh, that were also seen throughout the world in many different countries. So uh, that's something that we should keep in mind in preparation for anything in the future. Right, we should. Mm -hmm. Dr. Kim, health authorities here have also detected a new variant. What can you tell us about this new strain? Well, this, there are many, just a sort of just a, several variants actually circling, circulating around the, the global the scale. But the one that specifically we are concerned about, the, the BA.2.12.2, uh, this is a sub-lineage of this uh, Omicron variant. And then this actually is a, a sort of just becoming more just predominant in the U.S. As of now, it now just accounts for about just 40 percent of all just new COVID-19 infections in just the U.S. And then in terms of when, whenever just a new variant just comes, just coming out, then that we are concerned about. The, how the transmissible or how severe disease it actually causes. So in terms of transmissibility, it seems to be actually more fit than the, some previous just variants. So that's why just we are seeing just more of a, just a percentage of this variant in US. But we do not know for sure whether it is just because of inherent just a replication, just in, enhanced the capacity or just a, a certain just immune evasion. And also some severity, uh, we do not know for sure. And uh, also in terms of severity, now it is very difficult to the judge about the, the severity because uh, now many people are somehow immune, not just uh, naive anymore. Somehow just many people are just immune by the uh, vaccination or like uh, some natural infection. So the, it is really difficult to, to, to judge the severity. But I think uh, many people agree that the, uh, the, this new variant would not just pose any other, other additional just uh, the severity upon the uh, some, uh, currently just circulating just the variants. And for the vaccine and then some uh, drugs for the vaccine, I think uh, many people just agree that the vaccine would still just work. But I'm not quite too sure about the uh, some neutralizing just 
the capacity of the antibody that induced by natural immunity, natural infection, or just the vaccine, the vaccination. That will be actually decided by the scientists and the clinicians in the near future. And for drugs, well, maybe some most of the chemical drugs, which include uh, some Paxlovid and then Molipravir, Remdesivir, I think it should still just uh, work against this new variant. However, I'm not quite sure about just a monoclonal antibody. Basically, just a monoclonal antibody is very vulnerable to the any just a mutation, especially on the, the mutation occurring on the, uh, the spike gene. So we do not know for sure, but this will also be examined in the near future by the scientists. Right. Professor Kwak, given this recent detection then of um, a new variant and so forth, what are your thoughts on the wisdom of lifting quarantine for COVID-19 patients, which may happen in May, on May 23rd, as COVID-19 has now been designated or downgraded, that is, to a class 2 infectious disease? Well, let me begin by iterating the fact that I'm a clinical physician. So I'm probably in the most conservative um, state in, 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 in the view of possibly lifting the mandate for masks. Uh, the thing is, I think it's too premature because currently, all globally, uh, we're observing many other countries going through the second resurgence after the huge pandemic or the wave of the Omicron wave. And we are quite likely to go through that as well. But if it happens to coincide with the lifting of the mandates for the mask, um, uh, it, it can actually create a larger number than expected or larger number than what we can handle uh, to even the milder cases. Even if um, the future variants or the future resurgence could happen from something milder in its severity, if it happens with great numbers, uh, it's going to be uh, very burdensome on the medical sector, obviously. So um, the discussion of lifting the mandates for masks, uh, we're already having no mask mandates anyways on the outside. Um, so I don't think we can really prematurely uh, talk about lifting further already lightened um, uh, social distancing guidelines because it's pretty much the bare minimum we're currently keeping. Right. And Dr. Kim, authorities have said that a decision on the lifting of mandatory quarantine for COVID-19 uh, patients will depend on our tallies. What are your thoughts on this stance? Is it practical? Well, in the end, uh, I think uh, this uh, COVID-19 pandemic will just uh, becoming more of more of some just uh, goes to the uh, some actually endemic phase. Uh, endemic phase means that uh, all the uh, the tests are very stable, just static, neither rising or nor falling. So in in this case, I think uh, we need uh, in the end we need to just uh, the think about the uh, such kind of just uh, lifting just uh, lifting all the mandate. Well, when you think about just the flu, the, we do not actually quarantine just the uh, people where after they are uh, just uh, uh, got just the flu and so for this COVID-19 in the end we will not actually we would not just require any just a mandate that's quarantine for the old COVID-19 patient but uh, I think in the end uh, this uh, we are actually the, in the era of just uh, shifting the responsibility from the res responsibility from the government now from the the uh, responsibility for, uh, of the uh, each individual so now all the resources are pretty much available especially in Korea now the vaccines uh, we are now just even just having more surplus of the vaccine and then as long as we secure just a uh, uh, secure just a uh, uh, oral bio orally just the uh, antiviral drug drugs then uh, there is a we have all the uh, measures we can actually prevent and then the control the uh, COVID-19 then we can maybe just uh, go for the uh, some uh, especially just a normal life without well especially uh, well in this case just uh, living with COVID-19. Right a new normal. New normal exactly. <laughs> Professor Clark second booster doses are also being uh, recommended here for those in their 60s and above uh, what are your thoughts on this campaign? I've requested that my parents were injected with the first shot, and they did. They actually received uh, uh, vaccines made by Novavax, and they did not go through any side effects at all. Uh, the reason I specifically asked my parents to receive their second booster shot is primarily because I wanted to sort of keep the immunity, at least in the antibody levels against COVID-19, knowing that they haven't been exposed to COVID-19 yet. My other family members, my family, my, my personal family members all have gone through COVID-19. I know for sure that we have, we must have built up sort of, uh, some sort of immunity against COVID-19, whether that be through uh, vaccination or uh, through natural immunization or, or natural va um, uh, immunization, sorry. But uh, knowing my parents haven't gone through any infections 
priorly. Uh, I wanted to make sure that they're in the safe place by still yet again boosting the immunity by vaccinating them. Uh, and thankfully, they didn't go through any, even the mildest bit of the side effects afterwards. So I'm thankful that I did. But also for any people who could be exposed to the virus yet not having gone through the infection, also those who are uh, more likely to be prone to severe types of COVID-19, such as those immunocompromised or people having severe cases of uh, underlying diseases, I strongly recommend that they should receive their second boosters as well. Right. Dr. Kim, over in the US, there have been a few reports about a rebound in symptoms after treatment with Paxlovid. Could you tell us a bit more about this? Yeah, that was kind of just a hot issue among the uh, some, uh, over the, uh, the social media just recently. And then uh, even just uh, some uh, one the case report was actually just uploaded in the preprint server. And uh, the, the thing is that uh, well, uh, this is not quite just a user thing, and then the, the, but the good thing is that even after just a relapse, in this case, of some certain people just after Paxlov, and then they experienced the, just, uh, just COVID-19 symptoms again, but at least uh, after examining the, the viral sequences, uh, we could not see any just uh, potential uh, uh, drug-resistant mutation, which is very good. And then uh, this is quite unusual, but uh, when we actually look at the, uh, some uh, phase three clinical trials for this Paxlov by the Pfizer, actually there was uh, some small number of people actually experience this kind of a relapse. And so about one or two percent of the participants actually experience this kind of just sort of just a biphasic COVID-19. And then what is interesting is that even just the, the people in the some placebo the drug experience this biphasic disease. And so we do not know all the, we do not have the, all the answers for the, all the, the potential questions. But the good thing is uh, there's no just a resistant mutation was found. And also uh, at, as of now, uh, we, uh, some people are actually asking for some a longer treatment instead of the five days just the treatment just course and also some maybe retreatment for these people but as of now I think just the current regimen for this five day treatment should be fine. Professor Kwak, here on the local front, you mentioned the mask mandate earlier on. Now, the decision to lift the outdoor mask mandate was made by the previous administration. What are your thoughts on the possibility of a reversal in the outdoor mask mandate in the case of a rebound, as you mentioned, sometime in late spring or early summer? Well, I want to mention a couple things in regards to that. Number one, uh, this uh, sort of issues, uh, something that concerns health of the population should not be politicized. So it doesn't matter what the prior government would have decided on, it should still the same if it benefits the population. It should be lifted if it doesn't benefit the population. Now that being said, the mandate for mask has never been there for outdoor activities if people were two meters or farther apart. So the lift of the mandates for mask that was made a few months back or a couple months back, within a couple months back actually, that did not actually change the scheme of wearing the mask on the outside. I've actually never worn a mask when walking on the street when there are nobody's around. It's just a matter of how crowded the place would be that the mandates have started to defer. So uh, I don't think there's a great possibility that people will start uh, uh, suddenly mandating masks uh, on, uh, on the outside uh, when they haven't already done so in the past two years. So I foresee that there won't be any um, drastic measures taken to really change the scheme with that that we see on the outside however I think people are beginning to realize that that, that they were confused so in back, uh, back in the, uh, the the peak of the pandemic they actually wore the mask even on the outside now people are realizing they're allowed not to wear the mask anymore so I think there's a possibility that might have affect the transmissibility of COVID-19 further into their schedule but once again, I don't think uh, politically speaking or this, schematically speaking, I don't think there will be huge changes. Right. And Dr. Kwak, going back to the idea of a resurgence, the widespread belief is that there will be a rebound in late autumn. Do you agree? Well, I think uh, maybe any time. I mean, anytime it's just autumn or summer, just uh, that may be actually, uh, dep that way actually depending on the emergence of any potentially new variants and also our, our just immune status. I mean, the, uh, after our immune status, especially just the neutralizing antibody levels will just uh, decline after like uh, some uh, couple of months later. So that, that, which means that uh, we are actually vulnerable to the reinfection of the, uh, even just for the same, just a variant. I mean, the, for the reinfection with the, uh, the same kind of virus, not just the new 
variant. It is just for sure. But uh, the good thing is uh, we have uh, two, uh, another just a layer of just protection, which is comforted by the T cell responses, as a cellular immunity, and that, that actually uh, uh, actually proven to be uh, just uh, last a very long time. If like uh, after natural infect natural infection, it lasts. As far as I know, it lasts up to just one year, and then for the vaccinate, at least uh, six months. And then uh, actually, there's uh, some report that uh, some uh, the T cell response elicited by the, the original SARS cor SARS coronavirus one actually lasted 17 years. So that which means that uh, we are not uh, we are not going to just uh, experience any just, uh, a huge increase of the severe cases even after this uh, the emergence of just a new variant. Right. Professor Kwak, what preparations then do you recommend for the medical arena in light of this projected rebound, which of course uh, Dr. Kim has pointed out may not be as severe as we fear? Right. Uh, and because we project that it might not as be severe as uh, the past waves or so, um, we need to go back and see what we missed during the peak of the pandemic. We started missing um, acetaminophen pills. We started missing very symptomatic management pills. So those are something that we need to stock up right now just in case there is another resurgence. Obviously, we would need to, our, uh, we would need to get our hands on those stocks for uh, Molnupiravir and Paxlovid so that it could be distributed to anybody who needs it. But also, since we project uh, the next wave is going to to be rather milder, we need to get hands on those stocks that treat symptomatically, that can bring down the fever, that can bring down the symptoms as well. Right, so boost our COVID-19 arsenal then. Exactly. All right, Professor Kwak, as always, thank you very much for your thoughts. Thank and you. Dr. Kim, thank you very much for your insights today. The 20th South Korean presidential inauguration took place earlier on Tuesday and amid the frantic press coverage of the event by most media members, my colleague Shin Yeun had the rare chance to cover the event from the perspective of an ordinary citizen invited to the ceremony to take a look. It's May 9th, 11.10 p.m. here in Seoul. A few days ago, I received an invitation to attend the inauguration ceremony of the 20th president of South Korea, Yoon Song Myor. I can't believe I've been selected because the committee only invited 20,000 Korean civilians. Any South Korean citizen who wanted to attend could apply online from April 8th to the 14th. There was a 66% chance of people being selected. The envelope I received in the mail included a letter with some things I need to be aware of, as well as a map explaining how to get to the National Assembly. It also included which gate to enter by. I arrived here a bit early, but I don't think I'm the only one who's decided to use public transport to get here. There's already a lot of people who seem to be going to the inauguration ceremony with me. Before heading inside the plaza where the event was set to take place, I talked to a few others who had been invited. I've been invited to President Yoon's inauguration ceremony. Like everybody else, I have high hopes for the new government. Under the new administration, I hope the lives of every disabled person, particularly those working in arts like me, get easier. Unfortunately, I missed the opening ceremony because the security guards had closed the gates right before and after President Yoon arrived. We've all been waiting for over an hour and 30 minutes to get inside the National Assembly. The line is finally moving along as the ceremony has started at 11 a.m. sharp. As you can see, there's a lot of people going in. There's still a long line behind me. And we're walking to the sound of the national anthem in the background. I finally made it. I'm going in to see the 20th president of South Korea. As soon as I got in, the security guards checked for my ticket and my belongings. I had made it just in time to hear the president give his first speech. The inauguration ceremony ended with President Yoon giving fist bumps and greeting civilians that attended the event. I'm one of the many Koreans waiting to see the president himself. He'll soon be walking down from there. 
President Yoon is now off to Yongsangu district where the new presidential office is located. This inauguration ceremony has brought thousands of Koreans across the nation to attend, including myself. It's definitely been a day that I can never forget. Shin Yeun, Arirang News. Also, the former presidential office, better known as the Blue House, opened its doors to the public on Tuesday, as promised by President Yoon Seo Gyal. And according to Arirang's Kim Yeon Sung, some even skipped school to visit the place. To take a look. The Blue House grounds have opened up to the public for the first time in 74 years. I'm so happy and grateful that such a chance has come for me. I'm going to look at each place that's open. It's not every day you can come here. Mom said we should come here since it's opening day. I like missing school to come here. It took four hours for me to come here. It's really meaningful that it's opening for the first time in 70 years, and I think it's really good for the people. The Blue House used to be a place we'd only see on the news or on TV. But coming here, it feels so different and majestic. On opening day, around 26,000 people got the chance to take a peep inside the former presidential grounds. Indoors still remain off-limits, however. Authorities still need time to sort confidential documents and office fixtures before opening up to the public. Before then, visitors can only take in the exterior view of the famous Blue House halls, like Yongbingguan, the official reception hall for foreign dignitaries, and Chimnyugak, Seoul City's tangible cultural heritage as a traditional Korean house from the early 1900s. The Blue House's garden, Nokjiwon, is known for its lush greenery. Visitors can take a stroll while enjoying the scenery that has over 120 types of different trees and the famous 700-year-old pine tree. The hiking trail behind the Blue House that leads up to Pugaksam Mountain also opened up on Tuesday morning for the first time in over five decades. It's been 50 years since I've lived in the area. I've always passed here but couldn't go in. I'm so grateful and happy that this place is open now so that the residents can come and go. The Blue House gates will be open from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. for the rest of the days leading up to the 22nd of May. After that, authorities have yet to decide how to manage public tours. The Blue House intends to take in up to 39,000 guests per day. People who are interested can sign up in advance through mobile apps Kakao, Naver or Toss. Kim Myung-sung, Arirang News. Prior to entering office, the UN administration shared its intentions to align Korea's age to that of its global partners. First, our issue tells us what this means. In Korea, there are three ways of counting one's age. First, there is the universal age where babies are zero years old at birth and gain a year every birthday. This method has been the official way to count age in most legal definitions and administrations since 1962. Then, there is another official way called yonnai, or literally annual age, in which babies are also aged zero at birth but gain a year every January 1st. This method is used to define legal age for certain areas of law, such as military conscription or juvenile protection. And then there is senenai, or counting age, commonly known as Korean age. In this method, a baby is considered a year old at birth and gains a year every January 1st. For me, it's a little difficult because I have to count first. Uh, but I think it's an interesting way of counting your age, I think. It's uh, very special about Korea. There are many theories about the origin of South Korea's system of counting age, which in the past was also used in other countries, such as China and Japan. Experts say the lunar calendar used in Asia has had an influence. Using the lunar calendar, people's birthdays change every year. This made it easier to add a year to one's age every year instead of on a person's birthday. 
While other countries abandoned the system over time, the Korean language with honorifics made it difficult to do so. In case of the universal age, a person's age changes depending on the birthday, but that's not the case with the Korean age. Instead, everyone ages together on January 1st. This keeps the titles and honorifics consistent. But the coexistence of different age systems has caused confusion, such as when dealing with COVID-19 vaccinations, Korea's wage peak system and insurance policies. That's why recently, the Presidential Transition Committee pushed for the widespread use of universal age. With one unified age counting system, it would be easier to figure things out. It would lessen confusion in contracts and administration and reduce associated social and economic costs. The Ministry of Government Legislation is planning to submit an amendment to the current General Act on Public Administration to the National Assembly within this year. This would define universal age as the official age system used in all legal and administrative matters and would also encourage its use in unofficial settings as well. Lee si Arirang News. And in related news, our Song yoo now tells us about the public response to the new administration's efforts to change the way Koreans count their age. South Korea's 20th president, Yoon suk yeol was sworn into office on Tuesday. As part of his campaign pledge, President Yoon promised to scrap the Korean age system and adopt the universal age, citing the, quote, social and economic costs resulting from using multiple age systems. So how do Koreans feel about this change? I think using universal age will bring confusion. In Korea, people call each other differently depending on who is older. If I meet a person who is the same age as me now but whose birthday is next week, what should I call her after her birthday? However, there are also those who welcome the change. I didn't notice this when I was younger, but whenever I change jobs, employers are concerned about my age. So I'm happy about becoming a year or two younger. With South Koreans showing both anticipation and skepticism towards adopting the universal age system, what will be different once the change takes effect? The new age system is expected to guarantee clear communication, but there are obstacles that lie ahead as well. Domestically, unifying the age system will provide a set age standard for administrative and welfare services. From a global perspective, signing or interpreting contracts that include age will be easier. However, laws that affect a significant portion of the population, such as military service and juvenile protection laws, have been using annual age. To minimize administrative inefficiency, both expert and public opinion will need to be heard before a decision is made. In order for the new age system to take root properly, efforts by the government are also needed. The government should play an active role in helping South Koreans become familiar with using universal age. For one, it could create easy-to-understand content such as webtoons that highlight the benefits of the new age system. Aiming to unify the age system by next year, the UN administration will start by establishing relevant codes under the General Act on Public Administration. Song Yujin, Arirang News. Let's take a look at what's going on in the world now. In Afghanistan, a new rule announced by the Taliban has led to protests. Taking to the streets on Tuesday, women in the country protested recent restrictions imposed by the administration. This follows a ruling made by the Taliban Supreme Leader on Saturday, decreeing that Afghan women must cover their faces. The move signals an escalation in restrictions on women in public and comes amid growing backlash from many Afghans and the international community. While most women in the country wear a headscarf for religious reasons, many in urban areas don't cover their faces. In recent months, the Taliban also introduced rules on women traveling without a male chaperone, alongside a ban on men and women visiting parks at the same time. This despite assurances from the group that they have changed since their previous repressive period in power. Authorities in Armenia have detained 61 anti-government protesters. The arrests were made on Tuesday in the capital Yerevan at a march that saw hundreds of people demand the resignation of Prime Minister Nikol Pashinyan. 
While initial footage showed a peaceful demonstration, video taken later revealed police making forceful arrests. There have been a string of protests in recent weeks as pressure mounts on the PM, with at least 92 protesters detained late last week. Pashinyan is under fire for agreeing to a ceasefire brokered by Russia in 2020, when Armenia was defeated by Azerbaijan, losing territory around a disputed region. The United Nations General Assembly on Tuesday elected the Czech Republic to its Human Rights Council, replacing Russia. Russia was suspended from the council last month, two years into a three-year term, over its invasion of Ukraine and allegations of horrific human rights violations. The Czech Republic will complete that period on the council instead, although it cannot make legally binding decisions. Receiving 157 votes in favor while 23 countries abstained, the Czech Republic will start its term immediately. The Human Rights Council is slated to hold a session on Ukraine on Thursday, following a request by Kyiv for a review of the situation there. Tesla CEO Elon Musk has said he would reverse Twitter's ban on former US President Donald Trump if he completes his takeover bid. Speaking virtually Tuesday at a car conference organized by the Financial Times, Musk called the ban a mistake that, quote, alienated the country. Twitter permanently banned Trump in January 2021 over repeated rule violations. The platform also cited the risk of inciting further violence following riots at the U.S. Capitol on 6 January 2021 as part of its decision. Trump has previously said he would not return to Twitter and will instead use his own truth social platform. Andy Warhol's 1964 portrait of Marilyn Monroe has sold for 195 million U.S. dollars at an auction in New York City. Monday's sale is a record for a piece by an American artist, breaking the previous record set in 2017, when a painting by Jean-Michel Basquiat sold for $110.5 million. Shot Sage Blue Marilyn is one of a series of portraits Warhol made of the actress following her death in 1962, and is one of pop art's best-known pieces. Under Hammer Price, the portrait sold for $170 million, with fees adding on an extra $25 million. Matthew Ashley, Arirang News. Good Wednesday afternoon. We had some slight rain, but things are clearing up. Now that the sun is breaking through the clouds, it's still partly cloudy in many regions. And it's been raining on and off on Jeju, 5 to 10 millimeters, and slight drizzle on the south coast. Well, thankfully, fine dust is not bothering us today, but always factor in wide gaps in readings, which is a current trend for inland regions. So it was chilly in the morning, early summer-like heat in the afternoon, and it will be much, much cooler again in the evening. So I hope you just grab your jacket for later today. As warm and moist wind is blowing into the country, high temperatures in the southern areas are spiking up to 27 degrees. Well, that is much higher than the average. On the contrary, east coast regions will stay relatively cooler. So until the weekend, it's going to be rather hot in inland regions. So Seoul is reaching 28 degrees tomorrow. But after another round of spring rain on Jeju, it will be slightly cooler at the weekend. Now, let's take a look at the worldwide weather conditions. And on that note, we say goodbye. Do join us again tomorrow, same time, that is Thursday, for more coverage. Thank you for now.